Okay, very good morning to you. Hope you're doing well. It's Wednesday the 9th of June. and going to just give you a quick update of where we closed on Wall Street, which was absolutely flat. So it's not going to take me long to explain what happened yesterday or Monday, which is not a great deal. Uh, and I don't think that really comes as too much of a surprise, given the fact that we know that on Thursday really is the real highlight of the week. And that is the US CPI reading. We also get something for things like the ECB monetary policy meeting as well. Uh, today, it's a little bit more interesting on the calendar. We've already had some uh, Chinese inflation data, which you can see here, which we'll talk about in a moment, which came out overnight. We've also got the Bank of Canada rate decision this afternoon and all inventory uh, numbers coming as well, following the APIs last night, as well as an auction coming out of the US. But uh, again, Today's calendar, a little bit more going on, but still not a great deal and still a day before the kind of main event still to come. So keep that in mind, I think, when you're just thinking of intraday day trading strategies and the way the market's been reacting of late, which is talking to some of the traders yesterday, just having this kind of degree of, of, of patience uh, and not getting too caught up expensing your, your kind of ammunition, if you like, too early in the game, keeping some back for what's arguably going to be probably much greater market movement and overall then direction um, rather than this kind of flip-flop price action that we were seeing yesterday. And certainly, you know, if you were looking at the likes of gold yesterday, um, just have it up here, I mean, we saw some pretty extreme price movement on really not a great deal of information, if any at all. Um, we came up to, I guess, a fairly nice sweet spot around 1905 06 where the price actually turned on that initial um, change of direction and around the comics pit open yesterday which was kind of where these two trend lines met um, and close proximity to the prior day's high in the overnight session and then it kind of rocketed down came back uh, and not a great deal of rationale there certainly no real headlines to really explain a lot of that price movement um, at the time uh, elsewhere, if we're looking at the S&P 500, just respecting a general range for the time being. Um, it was this trend line going back to the high that we had back on the first, being respected a couple of occasions. We actually broke through that um, as we were just heading into the Wall Street Open, of which then we saw some selling pressure. And again, we dipped and then recovered. Not too much really to explain the rationale behind that. And I think just coming out of the microcosm of short-term um, price tick data actually the market's not really going anywhere this is as we know on the daily continuation um, you can see we've got right up there tested that all-time high and now we're just kind of sitting there waiting for that cpi report to hit and uh, you know and if it is a low ball number one would imagine then we'll get the breach and break and push on to the upside if it is a fantastically strong number well and above the market consensus then potentially then room to play back down to the 4200 and the range low that's been quite a key level here on the daily chart of 4180 and a half in the S&P 500. Otherwise, uh, in other markets, the dollar's very quiet. So major pairs are, are basically unchanged in the currency space. The 10 years unchanged. Uh, the one thing that has seen a bit of movement um, through yesterday's session, which was quite interesting, was oil really firm recovery, really going into North American trading hours. And um, we had before, as you know, been tracking that trend channel higher in crude, of which we which broke down two days ago. And we saw a bit of a dip down to 68.50. But as you can see there, after uh, finding a bit of a foundation uh, around that level and holding, price really just started to speed up yesterday. And again, not too much in the way of uh, an individual headlines that were driving that move. But we have now firmly broken above 70. And you can see here this $70 handle as marked by this rectangle. That was the previous high. The kind of short term um, objective then was some um, short term price or profit taking. Uh, and then we come back up to that point. We broke, come back down. And that's acted as a nice platform for the push higher we've seen in the overnight Asia pack session. And we remain higher at the moment up around 36 cents at 70.41, the intraday high seen at 70.62. So on the daily chart now, still needs to be watched and obviously where we close on the day will be quite key. But as you can see on the daily, we're starting to really push up to levels not really seen since the summer of 2018. Longer term objectives here would probably be around 72 and a half, which would be 
the highs that we saw in mid-October of that year in 2018, and then up to the next area around 75 handle psychologically, and also those highs from October 18 and the peak of price activity in the summer um, in July of 2018. Um, I'll run through the APIs that we had last night, but overall summary there had close to no impact on price overnight. So let's let's jump into this Chinese inflation situation. What exactly is going on? And overnight you had Chinese PPI, which you can see here, uh, denoted by the, the white line, came in at 9%. This is for the month of May on, on the year-on-year -year figure. That was above expectations of 8.5 and an acceleration at the highest kind of pace if you like since 2008 uh, and that was from nine percent from 6.8 percent uh, the chinese cpi year on year was actually weaker than expected came in at 1.3 percent against expected 1.6 and previous 0.9 percent so you can see here the divergence that we're getting which is quite clearly pre price pressures on the producer side but at remaining much more benign as far as consumers are expecting and here's a couple of uh, interesting points to, to obviously be aware of. So the rally that we've been seeing in commodity prices has been fueled obviously by a few different things. We're going through a phase of economic recovery, pandemic-induced supply shortages are apparent at the moment. Remember, we've had uh, commodity prices, everything from copper to iron to lumber, although a lot of those prices have pulled from those initial spike highs, they are still very elevated. Uh, and then we've had records amounts of stimulus from governments from all over the world as well. And so far, the impact of metal prices has showed up mainly in what we call upstream industries. So that being things that are involved with the actual mining of those aforementioned metals, for example, processing those raw materials. Price increase in downstream industries like furniture and textiles have been fairly uh, minimal at this point. There's a couple of interesting points then that that leads to, which is if you're looking domestically uh, in China, the pass through from PPI to consumer prices has been fairly uh, limited. In fact, China's inflation gap between factories and consumers is now its widest since the early 90s in 1993, as you can see here. Uh, we saw a bit of a peak um, in recent years. This would be going back to 2016. But again, we're now over that uh, and back to those levels in 1993. Now, one of the points here being is that intense competition among smaller businesses um, spurred by the rise of e-commerce, weak domestic demand uh, means China's factories are absorbing input costs um, rather than passing it on to consumers at home. And obviously, that's a really important point. How long that can be maintained, though, is something that's going to be quite quite a thing to keep an eye on going forward about this idea of um, how transitory or not these inflationary pressures are going to be. Um, the other thing then is about food prices. Um, anyone who's been tracking China and inflation will remember around a year ago or so, uh, this is when the pandemic really took hold over that Lunar New Year period of 2020, but pork prices were going parabolic at the time. Um, there was lots of Different reasons, but one of the main ones was the African um, swine flu, and that was leading to a large culling of pig farms, and so it's squeezing on the price of pork, of which obviously is a staple of Chinese cuisine. Uh, and what we're seeing now is the complete opposite of that. Uh, and actually, the inflation numbers overnight, if you start looking at um, CPI inclusive of things like energy and food prices, uh, almost 24% full was seen in pork prices. Um, undercut stronger price rises for most other foods. So you're getting a rebalancing of that pork situation. Uh, and given it was such an outlier last time, then it's having quite a, uh, an impact on decreasing the overall figure. And uh, separately to that data, the government apparently has pledged to increase the supply of key food products to stabilize prices and add to the national pork reserve. So yeah, a couple, couple of things there to be aware of. First of all, from a trading point of view, uh, none of this really, I feel, is is uh, meaningful for the different charts and products that we just looked at. So if you're trading U.S. indices, uh, the FX markets, dollar-based um, commodities, things like that, I wouldn't be looking at this Chinese data thinking, right, I need to strategically formulate some sort of trade idea intraday on the back of that. 
Um, that's not what I'm saying. I don't think it really carries that type of immediacy in terms of its its impact. But it definitely is interesting. Um, again, though, it's not surprising, I wouldn't say, because this divergence that we've been seeing from PPI and CPI in China is not new. Uh, it's been ongoing. It's just that it's getting even further apart at this point in time, as mentioned here in this widening gap between factory and consumer um, inflation gap. So just something to be aware of. Um, other things then to talk about, uh, Rishi Sunak here, the UK Chancellor. Um, yesterday we were talking a little bit about the potential on the Times headline at the weekend, talking of a two-week delay to the uh, final step of the roadmap to reopening the UK on June 21st. Well, The Guardian has an exclusive, and basically they've said that Rishi, the um, Chancellor, is willing to accept a delay of up to four weeks for the final reopening in the UK. Uh, the government's considering um, ex those extensions. Uh, a final decision, though, is to come from the PM on Monday when we get the latest update from Boris Johnson. Now, the rationale here has logic, and it being, if I scroll down to give you a bit of an idea of where we're at at the moment, here's what the COVID situation is. And you know, it's not that we're seeing rapid number increases, but COVID daily cases are rising and that likelihood will, trans, will um, lead on to a, an increase in the, the death rate going forward it is the likely uh, probability of events unfolding. And this predominantly down to the Delta variant or the Indian virus or Indian var variant. The vaccination rollout continues and, and touch wood that should start to continue to pick up pace. 61% or so have now received the first dose. I get mine later on today, so I'll keep you posted on how I feel and what, what drug I get given uh, in tomorrow's briefing. And then people who've received a second dose is around 42% at the moment. Um, now, a delay of up to four weeks, the, the logic here would allow second vaccine doses for all over 50s to have been administered and take effect before reopening under the government's plan. So, so a couple things here. The Delta variant um, does have a degree of how, uh, or it does impact different variants of COVID, uh, how robust, let's say, the efficacy rate of these vaccines is. Cup two other kind of points here is whether you've had one or two jabs affects then the type of level of protection that you could expect as an individual. And then also the time frame after your jab, because generally then protection rates could uh, tend to increase over time and so one of the things here then is obviously over 50s typically is in the more kind of vulnerable half of the, the the age category and so allowing them to have their second jabs all people over 50 in the UK plus give them time for that um, the vaccine to really kick in and start hitting that kind of 80 90 percent uh, effectiveness rate rather than I've, I've read some reports that even after one dose, the Astra drug could be as low as you know sub 40%. Um, because of the fact that, remember, this reopening would be complete eradication of any social distancing, no requirement to wear face masks, no capping on weddings, no capping on uh, numbers at sports, and all these sorts of things. And so um, the government, given the um, transmissibility of the Delta virus, are very uh, keen to get those vulnerable ones under control first so that's where that's coming from the second kind of um, <clears throat> arrow if you like to the plan is that it would also coincide with the end of school summer term reducing the extent of which outbreaks can be fueled by children passing the virus onto one other uh, onto one another in the classroom I mean you'll probably recognize for me doing the briefing I've normally got a sniff I've got a runny nose right now or a cough because I've got a young toddler and she just goes to nursery and whatever any of the other kids have got, I get because she's just a carrier in that sense. And so part of the other strategy here of the government is that it's the end of the summer school term. So obviously then kids are off school for a number of weeks and that stops them the ability for them to not show symptoms but carry and transmit the disease then and pass it on to their parents, for example. Uh, so... One government source pointed out that many cases of the Delta variant have been among children, uh, and of course, not many of those are vaccinated as yet uh, as well. So I think 
uh, it's pretty clear to me that the, the 21st of June is going to be delayed. I guess the question is by how much, two or four weeks. Um, if Rishi Sunak, who's the Chancellor, whose main priority of work is then the state of the economy, and he's happy with four weeks, I can't really see too much then resistance to, to delaying by that much. It's more to do then with management of the internal Conservative Party at this point. YouGov polls I was looking at yesterday show that public opinion, I think this was back in April, uh, was it April? It must have been when the initial roadmap was outlined. The idea, the public perception of us reopening on June 21st was around 65, I think it was, percent. Whereas a latest YouGov survey, I think must have been conducted last week, now sees that the general public's perception of reopening on June 21st as only around 28%. So I think the public's pretty much geared up for this. It's it's the Steve Baker type conservative member that Boris is going to have to manage with this delay. From a market impact point of view, I don't think it makes a difference either way for the sterling currency, to be honest, whether they delay two or four weeks. Um, I think a lot of that's been, it, it's going to be as expected. Okay, a few other things. You just blow my nose one second. There you go. You know this. You know this recording's live when you need to watch me blowing my nose uh, rather than YouTube is doing the cut and the edit. Um, so, just wanted to have a look at Bitcoin. Um, strategists seeing possible drop towards twenty thousand dollars. Now, I'm going to bring Bitcoin into shot just for one second to give you a bit of context of recent price movement. And here it is. So. Let's put it on the daily chart. And I got a few markups here, of course, that we've been watching of late um, since we really peaked going back to, <laughs> it was only April. It wasn't even really that long ago. So from the April high, which we printed, which was north of 65,000, we're now um, down roughly 50%. Um, even from Fridays, we're down about 14%. Um, what was quite interesting yesterday, and Bitcoin was looking a bit susceptible to potential downside, and it certainly ignited the uh, the bears to come out of the woodworks to really call that lower price of 20k in Bitcoin. Was uh, we had this trend line going from October of last year, um, and also the 200 DMA, which we broke through, but importantly closed above yesterday. We have gone down to retest that overnight, but then bounced again off the 200 DMA. Um, but the point being is what these um, these different firms who have these more bearish calls are suggesting is that if we break 30,000, which was basically the bottom of that route that we had in crypto generally on the 19th of May, then that would open up the trap door to a, a slip down to 20K. Now, looking at this technically, I'm looking at Bitcoin futures here. There's a couple of stop gaps before 20K, I'd say, as marked by these, these boxes. You've got 27K, which was that previous uh, double bottom that we saw back in late January of this year. A slip down there goes back down to 22,500, which was the peak at the end of last year before the kind of ramp up that we saw into the new year. Uh, and then then going down to that 20k sub 20k region which would put us back down to where we were before we got the 20k more definitive break um, yesterday obviously we've had the irs ask congress for authority to regulate crypto um, some people were also talking about on bloomberg analysts pointing recovery of the colonial pipeline company's ransom as evidence crypto isn't beyond government control is another reason for the rationale of yesterday's decline. Um, I'd, I'd say it's probably a bit of a tenuous link, personally. Um, I think with with these sorts of things, there certainly is um, can be fundamental catalysts, and certainly China and a lot of their rulings over crypto and, and just general government authority intervention to regulate that type of thing, uh, to impede activity in the space, certainly is going to weigh and has been really the main factor aside from the likes of Elon Musk you know, dropping these little hand grenades every now and again. Um, so at the moment, I think Bitcoin does look a little bit susceptible. Um, you know, I, I, I can't recall all of the numbers, but I was talking to one of the guys yesterday and I was listening to a good podcast the other day and it was talking about the idea that actually the majority of money invested in Bitcoin, if you're looking at the entire... Um, 
kind of uh, ecosystem of what com- comprises of investments within Bitcoin, that the large majority are those people who really truly believe in the underlying potential of the technology, the philosophy of what Bitcoin is um, in terms of decentralized and, and blockchain and so on and so forth. And that the idea is that these guys are just buying on every dip uh, and that actually that comprises of something like, I'm sure the stat was 87% of all holders. And so I don't think necessarily, uh, I, I, again, it's, it's kind of a twofold approach, I guess, with Bitcoin. I think if you're going to trade it, um, I mean, I personally would, wouldn't go near it with a barge pole to trade it, but to invest in it, sure. Um, you know, there's enough people with enough clout and size, it would seem, with enough um, position accumulation um, that this market will inevitably go higher over the long term. Uh, and it's better to be invested in it to catch those those general moves higher uh, and surviving these dips. But yeah, trading it right now as of today, I think would be difficult because I think the market could well be susceptible. And if we do break 30K and drop to 20K, I don't think would be in any way a surprise if that materialized. And a drop of 20K, just to remind you, would be akin to about a 35% drop on the already 50% move lower that we've had. Uh, and you start talking about an 80% move on a correction from the high, and you think, my God, that's massive. Well, it's not massive for Bitcoin. So, um, you know, it's just something we'll keep an eye on as we go through the rest of the day. Okay, uh, final few things. If we look at um, US politics, this isn't, again, really moving markets, but an update. A group of Republican Democratic US House members are trying to keep alive the hope of a, of a bipartisan infrastructure package. They've agreed $761.8 billion in new spending over an eight-year period, together with the already agreed numbers. That would total now $1.2 trillion, which is obviously short of the Biden $1.7 but as per any negotiation, the goalposts are kind of um, converging in on one another. So some progression there uh, being made. In the oil market, we did have the APIs last night. Not going to dwell on these because in actuality, they had close to no impact at all uh, in terms of the price of oil. And, and, and really, I'd just be looking at them as a reference point as to determine the type of reaction we'll get um, later on with the DOEs. But crude, nonetheless, was a drawdown of 2.1 million. Slightly smaller and shallower draw than the 3.5 million expected. Cushing draw 420, gasoline build 2.4 million. All right, quick look at the calendar for today. Inflation data out the way. As I said, the calendar is pretty quiet today. So same rules apply. Just be mindful of your technicals um, and, and perhaps ranges being respected. Perhaps breakouts if those stronger levels are, are, are broken. But otherwise, you know, be ready for potentially another slow day, barring anything unexpected. You've got the Bank of Canada coming out at 3 p.m. Um, could be quite interesting. There are no changes expected in actual policy in itself in terms of rates or their QE program. However, you remember the bank reduced its bond buying um, from five billion to four billion um, last October, and then lowered that rate to three billion. Um, in April. So they're going through already tapering. So they're kind of way ahead of where the Fed are and even just having that discussion. No one's really expecting that taper to happen uh, again today, but a lot of people are looking that further tapering could be seen by the July meeting, where essentially at the moment the vaccination rollout in Canada has been fantastic. Uh, they've got a really steep curve in, in that sense, way better than the UK, the US and other areas. And so I think they're around 60% or so in terms of people receiving a first vaccination now. Um, the point being is that they've had some tricky COVID situations, which has required some restrictions and lockdowns in isolated regions within the country. However, going forward by July, we should have greater visibility on reopening trends, um, greater conviction on then to be had on whether or not it's the right decision to further roll back those bond purchases. So Something to look out for certainly would be a surprise if it came today and would certainly see a firm injection of price into the CAD if they did it now. Um, probably not likely so and probably more likely to come in July. Then you've got the DOEs at 
Um, Speaker-wise, no one really major. And then from an auction point of view, German supply index linker out of the UK and 38 billion in a 10-year note from the US. Um, all right, going to leave it there. Let you guys get on and have a good day. And I will see you in the AmplifyLive.com chat room. Take care.